Thank you. Um, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. This has really been a, an interesting uh, couple of days and uh, really enjoyed all the lovely talks. Um, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to the questions and, and feedback. Um, so let me start uh, first by just acknowledging the incredible uh, team of scientists who have done all the hard work um, that I have the honor to present to you today. So I'm showing us here in a photo from our holiday celebration, which was uh, at the end of 2019. Um, it's been hard to, to all get together again uh, since then, but um, I thought it was appropriate to show the full uh, lab family photo. So with all the kids and everything, um, probably like many of you, we've all had um, many more opportunities to interact with each other's families on a daily basis as we're uh, virtually um, getting together and trying to, to juggle caregiving and, and everyone trying to keep moving forward with their science. So I just want to acknowledge um, all the hard work and, and juggling that this team has been doing. Um, so my lab studies the, the neural mechanisms of learning and memory. That's really the focus of our work. And we're motivated by a long history of research in human patients. Um, like the one shown here, so patient HM, who suffered memory loss um, due to damage to the hippocampus and surrounding cortical structures. And um, as you probably know, this work was pioneered by Brenda Milner. Um, and it was from these case studies and the subsequent efforts to create an animal model of human amnesia um, that really demonstrated the critical role of the medial temporal lobe structures uh, in certain forms of memory. Um, but at the same time, there was a largely parallel line of research that was being conducted using neurophysiological methods um, to record from single units in the rodent hippocampus. And um, this work was really pioneered by John O'Keefe, uh, starting back in the early 1970s. And it's been followed up and extended by decades of research um, demonstrating exquisite spatial representations among neurons in the hippocampus and the adjacent entorhinal cortex. Um, and the very first talk in this meeting um, from Nakamulanovsky, you learned a lot about what was going on in terms of uh, spatial representations in the bat. And, and based on these early findings of place cells in the rat hippocampus, um, John O'Keefe and Lynn Nadell put forward their hypothesis about the function of the hippocampus in their book published uh, in 1978, so titled The Hippocampus as a Cognitive Map. Um, and so we really had these two lines of research, the one that was based on uh, work in humans that was focused on the mnemonic view of the role of the hippocampus, and then one line of research that was conducted uh, neurophysiological studies in rodents that was focused on spatial representations. And uh, in my lab, as I mentioned, we're, we're working to investigate neurophysiological signals in the, the related to memory using the monkey model. Um, and as I'll describe in a moment, by using a naturalistic viewing task, we sort of unwittingly discovered forms of spatial representation. And we spent the last several years trying to learn from the monkey model how we might resolve the apparent controversy uh, between the spatial and mnemonic views in terms of the function of the hippocampus. Now, monkeys provide a great opportunity for bridging between these two species um, because we can train our monkeys to perform a behavioral task that parallel um, and sometimes are identical to tasks that have been used in human patients. And we can also adapt the tools and techniques from rodent neurophysiological studies um, to record the activity of populations of single neurons deep in the monkey brain. So just to give you a, a sense of uh, what I'm gonna try to tell you today. Um, so first I wanna tell you about three current and ongoing lines of research in the lab. Um, so in the first section, I'll describe our discoveries around spatial representations in the monkey medial temporal lobe. And as I mentioned, these were discovered uh, by, while using tasks that utilize natural viewing behavior or naturalistic viewing behavior. Um, and these representations are associated with visual exploration. And then in the second part, um, I'll present some of our newer data using virtual reality, so sort of immersive video games for monkeys, um, to probe the mechanisms of memory formation. And then in the last part, I'll talk about our work looking at rhythmic neuronal activity in the hippocampus and relationships between hippocampal activity and eye movements. Um, and together, these studies have led to an emerging idea about how we might reconcile the spatial and mnemonic views of the function of the hippocampus. Um, so let me start with, with Alfred Jarvis, uh, who really has motivated a lot of our work. 
Um, and one thing that's clearly different about primates and rodents is that vision is a primary sensory modality for primates. And uh, we use eye movements to explore the, the world around us um, without necessarily needing to physically move around in our environment. And in the late 1960s, uh, Yarvis made the discovery that eye movements um, can provide an interesting index into a subject's cognition. So we move our eyes differently depending on, um, in this experiment, the instructions that Yarvis gave to his subjects. So either um, to examine the painting freely um, or to, uh, sorry, let me go back. Um, or to, uh, to estimate the material circumstances of the family. So in both of these cases, you can see the eye movement represented um, by this white trace, showing that the scan path was quite different, um, just depending on these uh, distinct instructions that were given to the subjects. So in our work, we also identified changes in eye movement that reflected memory for particular visual scenes. So in our, in our lab, we typically have monkeys um, seated looking at a computer monitor, and uh, we allowed them to just freely view a series of complex visual scenes while we recorded neural activity from structures uh, deep in the medial temporal lobe. And here is an example of the kind of behavior that we get in this task. So um, we showed the monkeys uh, a series of, of uh, complex scenes and each scene is presented twice and we just compare the eye movements when the monkeys are viewing the scene the first time uh, with the second time and so in this example the yellow trace shows the monkey's scan path the first time that he saw this picture so you can see that he uh, spends quite a bit of time looking around and then the blue trace shows the second time so here the monkey makes a few fixations and then quickly looks away from the scene and this is what we found um, across uh, now over 10 monkeys that we've uh, tested on this task. Um, here's sort of the average behavior across thousands of, of these kinds of images, that monkeys spend more time looking at the images when they're novel compared to when they're repeated. And this gives us a really um, sort of robust index of memory. Um, and this has been published in, in several papers and, and this kind of novelty preference has been shown in both uh, humans and monkeys. And so while we were using these studies to examine the neural signals that were related to memory for the visual scenes, um, we had the idea as we were watching the monkeys perform this task and they're spending um, all this time exploring these uh, different scenes, we had the idea that maybe primates use eye movements to explore space, um, similar to the way rodents explore their environment as they move around. And most of the neurophysiological studies in rodents uh, that had been recording from uh, the hippocampus and entorhinal cortex at that time had um, studied rats as they were moving around an open box, just exploring an open arena. And from these studies of environmental exploration in the rodent, um, you're probably all aware of it, uh, that there were several primary um, spatial types that were identified. Um, so John O'Keefe, as I mentioned before, discovered hippocampal place cells. So these are cells that fire um, or that respond whenever the rat is in one location within the environment. And then in the early 2000s, Edvard and Maybrit Moser discovered grid cells in the adjacent entorhinal cortex. So these are cells that respond to multiple locations in the environment. Um, and the firing fields for these neurons form a perfect uh, grid of the environment. And then there are border cells. So these are cells that fire whenever the rat is moving along one edge of the environment. Um, and then also head direction cells were identified. So these are cells that fire when the rat is facing or moving in a particular direction. Um, and these head direction cells were discovered in the entorhinal cortex, as well as regions of the thalamus and the precipiculum. Um, but in the, the early you know, 2010s, these kind of responses had not been identified in primates. And so uh, Nathan Killian, um, who was a, a graduate student in the lab at the time, he's currently an assistant professor at Einstein. Um, when he was in my lab, he was studying the neural signals for memory in the entorhinal cortex using this kind of laminar probe, um, which enabled recordings uh, throughout all the cortical layers um, as the monkeys viewed these complex visual scenes. And along with looking at the memory signals, we had the idea of looking at the firing of these neurons relative to the monkey's scan path. 
And surprisingly, it, Nathan found evidence for grid-like activity among a proportion of enterhinal neurons. So here on the left, what I'm showing you is uh, the, gray, the gray lines represent the monkey's scan path as he viewed hundreds of these complex images. Um, so the scan path for all the different scenes are just overlaid on top of each other. And then the red dot indicates um, where, the, where the neuron fired when the monkey was looking at this, sorry, the red dot indicates where the monkey was looking on the screen when a single enterhinal neuron uh, fired an action potential. And so this middle plot then shows the firing as a heat map, and the right plot um, shows the autocorrelation of the firing rate map, um, which really highlights the grid-like activity. So one uh, aspect of um, rodent uh, grid cells is that they have a, a change in their firing field size and uh, packing density um, as you move from the dorsal to the ventral entrinal cortex. So in the dorsal part of the medial entrinal cortex, uh, rodent grid cells show uh, pretty small fields and they're fairly tightly packed. And then uh, as the recording moves more ventral, you see larger fields that are spread farther apart. Um, and so we looked at this, the same kind of uh, relationship in the, um, the monkey entorhinal cortex. And for uh, the, the same kind of um, anatomical relationship would be moving a medial from the rhinal sulcus. So this is showing here a flat map of the monkey entorhinal cortex. And the red dots indicate our recording locations. Um, so this first one is a look, recording location that was very close to the rhinal sulcus, where Nathan found smaller fields uh, pretty tightly packed. And then as the recording location moved uh, more medial from the rhinal sulcus, you can see that the fields got larger and were spaced farther apart. So uh, sort of replicating the same kind of um, uh, change in, uh, in field size and structure moving through the entorhinal cortex. And so this discovery, I would say, really uh, changed the focus of my research uh, for a while. And so this slide shows that, that over the past nine years since that first publication, um, we've been able to identify all of the same kinds of spatial representations that had been uh, described in the rodents. So we found um, grid cells and border cells in the entorhinal cortex, um, cells that we named saccade direction cells because they uh, were selective for the angle of the trajectory of the saccadic eye movement. And we think um, these kinds of cells may be analogous to head direction cells. And then most recently, place cells um, in the hippocampus. And I'll say a bit more about those uh, in just a moment. So in terms of, of reconciling these two theories about the function of the hippocampus, I think these data demonstrate uh, an important first uh, thought, which is that there's not an overriding difference across species. Um, we can identify the same kinds of spatial representations in primates um, just via visual exploration rather than environmental exploration. Um, but I think there was still a concern, uh, at least in our minds, that maybe these flat two-dimensional representations were really not the same um, as rodents moving around in space. So several years ago, we began training monkeys to play these kind of immersive video games in virtual reality um, using a joystick to navigate a virtual space um, so that we could examine neural responses under these conditions. So I'm going to show you um, now a video of one of our monkeys. Uh, this is one of our early video games. Someone speak up if there's any problem with the video. Um, so this is the monkey Giuseppe. You can see his hand on the joystick down here in the bottom right. And uh, his task was to move around, explore this virtual arena, and find the bananas. And then every time he collided with the banana, uh, the virtual banana, he would receive food reward delivered through a, a tube positioned in front of his mouth. Um, we also tracked eye movements, and so that's represented in the video by the white circle. And um, we saw lots of interesting behaviors as the monkeys performed this task. So you may have noticed there, uh, he sort of looked around and then found the two bananas that were clustered, uh, decided to go for those first. Um, There's also evidence that the monkeys remembered the location of the next closest banana, uh, even when it was off the screen and they would make um, the appropriate turn to get to the next closest banana. Um, they developed a lot of interesting behavioral strategies. Um, they often had 
side preference. They preferred to turn to, to one side or the other, and so they would kind of explore the, the environment and then uh, figure out a way to, to sort of maximize their preferred turns to go to one side and then kind of scoop up all the bananas uh, heading the other way. Um, so lots of interesting, um, I would say, you know, I'd love to get your feedback, but I, I would guess sort of naturalistic like behaviors um, in this inversive env environment. Um, but at the same time, we wanted to increase our ability to record from a larger number of neurons. So we collaborated with Charlie Gray um, and uh, to develop a multi-channel microdrive that allowed us to chronically record from 124 single wires directed toward the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex. And this is um, actually the same drive that was uh, presented, that Ben Hayden presented yesterday. Um, and so this is a, a way of being able to chronically record from lots of electrodes uh, positioned to target structures deep in the brain. So for this drive, we were targeting um, the hippocampus, shown here in green, and the entorhinal cortex, shown in blue. And we also trained the monkeys to perform a spatial memory tasks, so similar to those used in rodents. And let me show you a video here. This is a, a monkey performing a spatial delayed alternation task. So he was rewarded for traveling down the center arm of the maze and then turning left or right on alternating trials um, to reach a reward at the end of the arm. So now we, we hid the banana in the, the tiki hut at the end of the arm. And I'll turn the volume up a little bit. Hopefully you can hear the sound of a single hippocampal neuron um, firing. And this neuron had a spatially selective response um, with the preference for the choice point in the maze. So that sort of middle point at the end of the, the center arm. And you'll hear that in just a second. So it kind of fires right there. Um, but it doesn't fire at the end of the rightward arm. However, it does have a strong preference for uh, firing at the end of the leftward arm. So I'll show one more trial so you can, you can hear that. So there's the kind of firing at the choice point. And then that strong uh, response at the end of the leftward arm. And so uh, we recorded from uh, lots of neurons uh, in three monkeys performing this task. Um, and this is work done by uh, Yoni Browning, a graduate student in the lab, and John Ruckman, uh, who's a research assistant professor. And this slide shows the response of a single hippocampal neuron. Um, so on the, the right here, these are raster plots. Um, and uh, the tick marks indicate an action potential, and each row represents a different trial. Um, so here, these are the left trials, and these are the right trials. And uh, the line in the middle indicates the choice point. Um, here, trials are sorted by performance, so the correct trials are black at the top, and the incorrect trials are in red at the bottom. And this neuron had a pretty punctate response um, just at the beginning of the right arm, as you can see here. And uh, one really uh, nice thing about virtual reality is that we can probe the activity of neurons uh, very easily across multiple environments. Um, so Yoni and John have recorded over 3,000 uh, individual neurons now while monkeys play the spatial alternation game. Um, and they uh, often put them in, in environments that are visually distinct. So here are two example neurons that were recorded in these two different environments. So in the recording day, uh, they first measured the response within a single environment, and then they moved the monkey to the new environment. And you can see that this neuron, um, while it had a robust response down the left arm in the first environment, it went pretty quiet in the second environment. And they put them back in the first environment, and you can see the, the response came back. So uh, this would be an example of a kind of uh, remapping. So remapping refers to the fact that the neurons have a preference for a specific location in one environment, um, again, like, like down the, the this left arm, um, but had a different response or, or became silent in a different environment. 
Now, this, this figure also highlights something important about what we identified uh, with, with all of these recordings. So I mentioned that we had, uh, I showed you a pretty punctate response in the slide before, um, and we did find cells that showed strong spatial representation, um, but they were a, a pretty distinct minority, I would say. Most of our uh, neural responses looked something like this one. So they had a response that sort of went down the entire arm instead of tiling just a small piece of the space. Um, and so this has led to some of our ideas that maybe these responses are not related to uh, the, the real spatial dimensions of the environment, but may instead reflect more about the behavioral task or the, the task epic um, and in the sense of responding uh, across an entire epic of an arm or really showing overrepresentation of salient behavioral points like the choice point or the reward point. And that's another um, aspect of these data that, that seems very clear. So um, pulling this back to uh, sort of reconciling these two views. Um, so these, these findings, I would say, suggest that spatial representations can be identified uh, in primates via both virtual, virtual navigation as well as the, the earlier studies of visual exploration. So why might we uh, see the same um, structure of the hippocampus involved in both memory and spatial representation? And there was an idea that was raised uh, by Yuri Busaki and Edvard Moser in a review several years ago that maybe the neural mechanisms that support memory evolved from mechanisms that support navigation. And so their idea uh, was that a form of navigation that relied on path integration and uh, sort of egocentric um, uh, self-referenced uh, mapping may have evolved to support episodic or self-referenced memory while a map-based form of navigation, this kind of allocentric navigation, may have evolved to support semantic memory or memory for facts. And so uh, we, we really thought about this idea a lot in the lab and had a lot of fun discussions. And uh, what's clear is that an important prerequisite for this idea is that mechanisms of spatial navigation um, that could support mental time travel, like remembering an event in your life, um, would require that these spatial representations should be able to be observed without any physical movement, um, even without eye movements. And um, the, this idea or this, um, this uh, sort of fact about spatial representations had been demonstrated in the rodent hippocampus, where place cells show reactivation um, in replaying a rat's previous trajectory. Um, but it hadn't been identified in enterrhinal cells. So uh, I had a visiting graduate student in the lab, Nicholas Filming, um, who decided to test this idea by training monkeys to fixate a central cross um, while presenting a, a stimulus moving in the periphery. So you can see here's the stimulus. And the monkeys had to maintain central fixation. So in this task, they couldn't move their eyes but they were rewarded for covertly attending to the peripheral stimulus and then responding by releasing their hold on a bar that was placed inside the chair um, when they noticed this subtle luminance change. So you may not have seen it, but um, there was a, a subtle change in luminance in the stimulus. And we could titrate that luminance change to make sure that the monkeys had to maintain attention in order to perform well in the task. So Nicholas recorded the activity of neurons in the entorhinal cortex while monkeys perform this task. And here I'm just showing the trajectory that the, the stimulus um, took in this task as the monkey was covertly attending to it. And uh, he found evidence for grid-like activity that reflected the location of attention even without physical movement. So here's an example of a grid cell. What we're showing is the activity related to um, the location of the attended stimulus. So again, the monkey is fixating this central cross and not moving um, at all, not even not moving his eyes, um, but finding this kind of spatial representation that reflected the location of attention. So, um, while there was evidence then for the prerequisites for this hypothesis, I think the, the field was still lacking a convincing demonstration um, that these structures were actually required for navigation um, or that these spatial signals had anything to do with memory. And so that's where the, the third idea comes in. 
And um, this idea about reconciling these views, I think has been perhaps the most influential in the last few years. And this is the idea that the hippocampal formation serves as a cognitive map by organizing all stimuli in our experiences. So not just mapping space, but also time um, and all other aspects of our experience. And uh, Howard Eichenbaum used to refer to this as a memory space, um, a way of kind of uh, organizing all of our experiences in support of memory. And so uh, there was recently a, a really elegant test of this uh, theory when um, Dmitry Aronov in David Tank's lab um, recorded from the hippocampus in rats trained to press and hold a lever, which triggered the delivery of a sweep of auditory tones and the rat was trained to release the lever whenever the sweep uh, reached a particular frequency. And so they demonstrated neurons that showed selectivity for particular tones. Um, and you can see that here in the middle plot. Um, so you can see this is the, the period where the tones were being presented and you see this sort of uh, sequential activity uh, reflecting the uh, selectivity for each of the different tones. Um, but I think importantly, what you also see is that there are neurons that reflect the entire space of the task. Um, and in fact, the, the sort of press time and the release time, these sort of salient behavioral uh, points in the task are, are actually overrepresented. Um, and this was something that, uh, that they uh, discussed in the paper and I think is really important, again, to think about uh, whether we should consider this uh, activity as really mapping or tiling a space or instead um, reflecting activity that uh, really relates to behavioral experience and kind of these, uh, these salient behavioral points. Um, in order to, to think more about these kind of uh, responses, in our lab, we're doing our version of this task, um, again, with, uh, with John and uh, Yoni working together. Um, we've trained monkeys to perform a, a, a color sequence task, so similar to the auditory sequence task. And here, monkeys hold the joystick um, to move through a sequence of colors, and uh, they release the joystick when they get to the target color. So the way we set up this task, this is the sequence that the monkey is passing through. Uh, for this particular sequence, this is the, the target color. And we give the monkeys a few um, training trials where they see the, the color uh, here given as the cue, so they know uh, when they need to release. But then after just a few trials, the monkeys are able to do the task without the cue represented, uh, just by remembering the, the target color. And we're looking at neural activity uh, recording in the hippocampus uh, for sort of uh, either tiling the sequence of a, of a, of a map um, or also relating to the, uh, the experience that the monkeys have uh, as they're moving through this um, each trial. And each day they can learn a new sequence of colors uh, along with a different color trial. And I think importantly, we're also uh, repeating colors within the sequence so that we can determine whether these uh, responses are um, selective for a particular perceptual stimulus, so a particular color, or if they instead maybe reflect progression through the task um, in a kind of ordinal uh, topology. Um, so I don't have data on this task, but just to tell you that this is what we're working on now um, and hope to have uh, the data collected from this very soon. Um, but this idea of the hippocampus being able to map arbitrary spaces, I think has really taken off in the field. And there have been several review articles um, that suggest that the hippocampus and enterinal uh, cortex, the responses in these regions can be used to map in a metric way, not just physical space, but spaces identified or defined by, by any kind of stimulus. Um, so here the example is of a car space uh, defined by the, the axes of the number of passengers and the engine power. Um, and then recently, another review article was pa uh, a review paper was published in Cell, and this suggests that taking into account the importance of experience, uh, which I think is a, a really critical idea, um, and that these maps of experienced relationships could be used to infer relationships in support of navigation in spaces defined by um, by any kinds of objects, and also for abstract relationships like uh, relationships within a family. 
Um, but over the, the past couple of years, I would say, and, and guided by our, our data, um, as a lab, we've moved away from that idea and uh, are putting forward a new suggestion, I think, uh, that instead it's critical to look at the hippocampal sequential activity if we really want to understand um, the organizing principle of the hippocampus and, and how this activity might support memory. Um, and I'll just throw out a, a shameless plug. So this paper just came out um, on Friday of last week. This is a, a perspective piece really led by John Ruckman and, and Mari Sosa at uh, Stanford, um, where, we, where we discuss these ideas about uh, the importance of, of ordered experience in terms of these representations. And so just to give you a sense of why we think sequences are so important, um, in the rodent, hippocampal sequences have been identified um, and they emerge from another phenomenon which has been called theta phase precession. Um, so this slide shows a rat moving down a linear track. Um, the red oval here represents the place field for a single hippocampal neuron. And uh, the hippocampus has a network rhythm that can be observed in the local field potential with high amplitude oscillation in the theta frequency. So in rats, it's around eight to 12 Hertz. And hippocampal neurons um, fire primarily in the trough of the, the theta oscillation, and they fire on earlier and earlier phases of theta as the rat moves through the firing field. <clears throat> and then when you look at a population of neurons recorded simultaneously, so each showing their own phase precession, what you find is then within each theta cycle, a sequence of neural firing that reflect the, the current location along with the previous and future locations uh, in a really beautiful and kind of precise sequence. And it's data like these, I think, that highlight the importance, um, again, of these sequences, how ubiquitous they are in the hippocampal activity, um, but also highlight the importance of the theta band oscillation for structuring the hippocampal activity. So uh, what about theta band activity in primates, uh, if this is really the, the critical way of structuring the activity? Um, well, it's unfortunately completely different, at least in our hands, uh, from what has been reported in rodents. Um, so John Ruckman again and Aaron Garcia, a graduate student at my lab, are working on this issue. And on the left, you can see data that John recorded from the rat hippocampus when he was in Howard Eichenbaum's lab. And on the right, you can see uh, data that was recorded from a monkey hippocampus, recorded in my lab. And uh, what's very clear, I think, is that primates don't show anything like this sort of stable, high amplitude theta band oscillation that's been described in rodents. However, if we go back to the, the naturalistic free viewing task, when we looked at the behavior of the monkeys during this visual exploration, um, we found that the eye movements themselves had a sort of rhythmicity. So monkeys and humans move their eyes at a low theta frequency. Um, fixations between saccades last about 200 milliseconds. So that means the eyes are moving at a rate of about five hertz, about four to five hertz. Um, and so what we wanted to do next was to to, to look at the relationship or, or identify whether there was any relationship um, between this rhythmic behavior of sampling the world through these saccadic eye movements and putative oscillations in the hippocampal local field potential. And so what this uh, slide shows in red are example raw traces from the hippocampal local field potential, and blue just shows the signal filtered in a low frequency theta. Um, here, the dotted line represents the time of the saccade. So these are just individual um, trials in the sense of individual eye movements. And what we found was that prior to the saccade, there was unlikely to be any relationship in the phase um, across these uh, different, uh, across the LFP recorded, again, a different, uh, for different eye movements. But after the saccade, there appeared to be a kind of phase reset. So now the, the phase was more likely to be aligned. And um, this relationship between hippocampal activity and active sensing um, has been described before. So it's been described in rodents. Uh, so phase locking has been uh, demonstrated since the early 80s between the phase of sniffing and rhythmic activity in the hippocampus. So this was work, um, again, from Howard Eichenbaum's lab. 
And there was also uh, demonstrations of phase locking between whisking behavior and the hippocampus. So this is work from Matthew Diamond's lab. Um, and in both of these studies, uh, both of these behaviors, whisk, sniffing and whisking in rodents occur at about theta frequency. Um, and in our studies, we found that there was a relationship between eye movements and the hippocampal rhythm uh, with the phase reset of oscillatory activity around the time of the eye movement. So uh, on the left here, what I'm showing you again is the, the distribution of fixation durations for the monkey. So uh, we move, monkeys move their eyes about once every 200 milliseconds. Um, and I told you that humans have the same kind of behavior. So this is just showing a distribution of the uh, sort of rhythmic uh, eye movement behavior in humans when they're engaged in different kinds of free viewing tasks. So all of these have a peak right around uh, 200 milliseconds. What's interesting is that uh, this appears to be, I would say, a rhythm that uh, that's that it seems that this kind of rhythm, this uh, sort of four to five hertz, uh, is a great rhythm for sampling the world and sort of breaking it up into distinct, discrete chunks. Um, this is a, a really intriguing paper um, indicating it's a it's a case report of a young woman, um, a college age uh, student who was born with a um, degenerative disease of her eye muscles. So she was unable to move her eyes, but her vision was fine. Um, she was doing very well in school. As I mentioned, she was a college student and she had developed an interesting strategy of, uh, to, to enable this normal vision. And that was that she uh, developed a strategy of bobbing her head. And when they measured the duration between head bobs, it also fit exactly this profile. So about, uh, she was bobbing her head at about four or five hertz. Um, and then I have to show this slide uh, for one of our organizers. So this is um, work that, that David Purple has talked a lot about. And this is that these theta band rhythms exist also in speech and language. Um, so this is showing the speech modulation spectrum uh, for, for many different languages that has a peak right around uh, four or five hertz. Um, and also this modulation spectrum is, is true for, for different kinds of presentations of, of speech. So audiobooks, um, sentences, interviews, and conversations. Again, a peak right around four hertz. Um, so this, I know I'm starting to sound sort of evangelical about this four to five hertz uh, theta rhythm, um, but it is remarkable, I think, how, um, you know, sort of across how many um, domains you can see the same kind of rhythmic uh, sampling behavior. And so as we showed that there was this phase reset in the local field potential, we also wondered whether there was any relationship with the, the spiking activity of individual neurons. So in our current data, um, work by Seth Koenig, who was a, a graduate student in the lab, um, as well as Yoni Browning, has identified that there are single neurons in the hippocampus that respond in a time-locked way to the eye movement. Um, and I'm showing an example of one here. So uh, this, again, is a raster plot. So each row represents a different eye movement. The green uh, line here at zero represents the time of the fixation start, so when the, the eye rests in a given position. And uh, they're arranged by the duration of the fixation. So short fixations are at the bottom um, and longer fixations are at the top. The red line here indicates the end of the fixation. And so what you can see is that this neuron had a really striking uh, punctate response at a certain time after the fixation start. And you can see it uh, again here for the, the second fixation. Um, and so when we started thinking about this perisychotic activity, we went back to the spatial representations. Um, and here are two example of hippo, two example hippocampal place cells. So one on the top and one on the bottom. So these dots uh, indicate where the monkey was looking when this neuron fired an action potential. Again, the gray lines um, show the scan path across hundreds of images that are just uh, collapsed on top of each other. The two colors indicate um, responses in the first and second half of the, of the trial to show the, the reliability of this kind of response. And here you can see uh, the neuron shows a, a really robust response after the monkey fixates into this firing field. And what we noticed when we started looking at lots of individual neurons is that the latency of the response relative to the start of the fixation could be variable across neurons. 
um, with some neurons showing responses that occurred right after um, the, the fixation and others showing a much longer latency. And so across the population of neurons, we found that uh, this population completely tiled the time of the fixation, again, around 200 or 250 milliseconds. And if we think of the fixation period um, as in some way analogous to a, a rodent theta band oscillation, or at least providing a similar kind of structure for the neuronal activity, then I think these data suggest that neural sequences may be identified relative to this structure. So uh, one caveat, I think, of this work is that all of these um, recordings were made uh, sort of in our older style of recordings, uh, sort of two to five neurons at a time. And so while this is suggestive of a sequence, I think we have to wait until we uh, complete our, our work looking at uh, larger numbers of simultaneously recorded neurons um, to really identify whether these have the same kind of features of, um, of theta band sequences. So um, going back to the virtual reality now, the question is what kinds of uh, eye movement behaviors do we see uh, when the monkey is engaged in this more um, kind of naturalistic task of moving through an environment? Um, and so far, when I showed you data from this task, I talked about space in terms of where the monkey or, or rather where the monkey's avatar was located in the virtual maze. Um, but uh, we've also been focusing on uh, looking at, you know, responses relative to where in, in the environment the monkey is looking. And so to study this in virtual reality, what Yoni has done is taken the monkey's calibrated viewing location on the screen and then projected that two-dimensional um, screen location into the three-dimensional space to find where in our virtual world the monkey is looking. And so here I'm showing you an illustration of how we do this. So the orange dot is the monkey's um, avatar moving through the environment. And the yellow lines represent a ray drawn from the monkey's eye position and projected onto the three-dimensional space. Um, and so uh, the objects in green indicate those that are hit by the ray cast of the monkey's gaze. And so we've also done some work looking at, at object specific and, um, representations. But if we focus just on the, the spatial representations, um, what you can see here are uh, two example rate maps from cells that have visual correlates. So they respond uh, strongly when the monkey is looking in these particular locations, um, and the response is, uh, is more reliable when looking at the gaze location compared to the monkey's avatar location. So then what about these sort of uh, fixation-related responses in this task? Um, so one thing that we've done, this again on the left shows the viewing of the 2D static images, so just exploring uh, the two-dimensional scene. But during virtual navigation, we also find that there are uh, responses that show um, tight locking to the time of the onset of the fixation. So here, this is a raster plot uh, for, for a given neuron that has a, a strong uh, visual representation or visual selectivity. And here I'm showing you uh, all of the, the um, different fixations, but they're arranged by the kind of fixation. So whether the fixation is um, outside of the field, which are these uh, purple ones here, or if you look down here, the ones that are moving into the field either from outside the field into the field or from one location in the field to another location in the field. And what um, I hope you can appreciate is that for these fixations that are in the field, you see this really striking um, uh, sort of increase in activity at a particular time after the fixation onset. And so all of these data, I think, are, are leading uh, us to think about the importance of kind of the internal state of the animal and also uh, the experience of moving through an environment. Um, and in developing these ideas, we were strongly motivated by a review article by Yuri Busaki and Dave Tingley. Um, and let me just present their idea here. So the top graph represents the firing of a population of hippocampal neurons relative to distance along a linear track. So each color indicates a different neuron, and uh, each row indicates a different trial. And so looking at this population, you certainly could decode the distance that the rat had moved down the track. 
Um, and in the second graph, the data are plotted relative to time in the trial. And so again, looking at this, you could easily, uh, you would imagine use these data to decode the time that had elapsed since the beginning of the trial. However, when you plot the data relative to the theta band oscillation, so now this is relative to theta cycles, um, I think that it's, it's clear that a much more precise picture emerges. So here it's clear that these neurons are firing in, in a sequence and that the sequence progresses through each cycle of the theta band oscillation. And so one thing that we're really working hard on now is to try to understand apart from um, eye movements, which we know uh, or which we think could provide a nice structure of neural activity, um, what are other markers that we could use to identify something like the theta band oscillation in the primate, given that it's not um, something that is just given to us like it is in, in the rodent when they're, um, when they're moving around and actively exploring their environments. Um, so this is something that, that, again, we're working hard on to try to identify what this, um, what might be markers of these kind of uh, theta band oscillations, and also to get a sense of what is moving the, the monkey through the, the different cycles. Um, again, you know, we think we've got data showing that, that this um, is related to eye movements, but um, because the this is sort of a semi-rhythmic activity, and also it's not something uh, that's present in every um, kind of experience that we have, uh, we want to look a little bit harder to try to, to think more about what could um, give us uh, access to this kind of important handle that we think for structuring neural activity. So I just want to end with one final video um, to give a, a sense of, of what what we think the promise is for these kind of immersive virtual experiences. Um, I was really impressed with all the work that, that Ben Hayden's group has done in terms of um, having freely moving monkeys. And I think there's gonna be um, some really exciting uh, findings that they'll, they'll have from that work. Um, but I also wanna show you, you know, what I think we could get from even these you know, less natural uh, kinds of uh, situations where the monkeys are immersed in a virtual environment. So I'm gonna show you a video of a monkey performing our uh, kind of a virtual um, task where he had to explore and uh, try to find the bananas in the open field. And we had a, a student in the lab who was working on uh, learning how to program these kind of video games. And she'd spent quite a bit of time developing a really rich environment that you'll see in just a minute. And the monkey was, uh, for this was the video, the first time that the monkey was put in this new environment. Um, so he was, you know, hungry from the day before. He knew exactly how to do the task to get the bananas. And what you'll see is that he started off uh, just going for the bananas just in the same way as before. And then in our minds, it's as if he suddenly realized that, uh, that something was different. He was in a new environment. So you can see the, here the white dot shows his eye movement. And even though he hadn't had uh, his you know, meal since the day before, so he was certainly hungry, uh, he was much more interested in exploring this new scene, um, trying to, uh, to get a hand, you know, I'm being very anthropomorphic, but this was our, our sense of what he was doing. Um, and this is where you start to feel sad for him. You want him to be able to, to actually get out behind the wall um, to continue exploring. So the bananas are there, uh, but, but again, he's just very interested in, in exploring this environment. And one thing that we're hoping is what now with uh, the ability to record from larger numbers of neurons simultaneously, we, we may be able to uh, better understand this kind of more naturalistic behavior, which I think um, will give us a, a better insight into forming episodic memories. Okay, so I'll just conclude there. Um, so what I've shown you is that many of the hallmarks of rodent spatial representations can be identified in the primate hippocampus and entorhinal cortex, um, and that uh, rhythmic neuronal activity in the primate hippocampus is associated with exploratory eye movements. Um, this perisychotic activity in the hippocampus, I think, suggests that eye movements can serve to organize the sequential activity of neuronal assemblies. Um, and together, I think all of these data are leading us to suggest that hippocampal activity really reflects the encoding of ongoing experiences of the organism, um, rather than a rigid map 
that's aligned to objective measurements about the physical world. So I'd just like to, again, acknowledge those in the lab who performed all the work. Um, I think I mentioned most of their names uh, throughout the talk, but I also just want to highlight the technicians. Um, so we have uh, Megan, who really uh, leads the lab. Um, we have Natalie, um, sorry, Megan, pointing to the wrong screen, Megan, um, Natalie, Ian, Brian, Nicholas, and AJ. Um, who really uh, did an amazing job during uh, this pandemic of coming in and taking care of the monkeys daily. Uh, this is work that really can't be done from home, and so I just want to acknowledge all, all their, uh, their hard work on that. Um, thank you, and, and also thank uh, our funding sources uh, for providing the, the funding for this work.